Welcome back to Sama Saturday, everyone. Sama Dogs, this is all about Sama Dogs Weekly Show to help you enjoy a more natural, healthy, and spiritual life with your beloved dog. My name is Amanda Reed, and I'm the founder of Sama Dog. It's always a pleasure to be here with all of you, and even a bigger pleasure to be shared in, in space and in purpose by my dear friend and collaborator and amazing veterinarian, Dr. Katie Kangas. So welcome to the show, Dr. Kangas. Thank you, my pleasure as always. I'm so thrilled to be here and to share lots of great information and I love the topics that you choose and this is a great one today, so thank you. No, you're so welcome. And our community is so important to us. You know, we love to take these little bite-sized pieces from information that either for Dr. Kangas or for I come up along the way, you know, whether we're hearing it from our clients or having it, the experiences with our own pack. As things come along, I often will note them and say, gosh, this is a great conversation to get into with the expert that actually knows how to truly guide us best. Dr. Kangas, as many of you know, is a regular um, participant, a regular um, uh, person, a guest who comes onto our show and shares her knowledge. She has a wonderful clinic here in San Diego called the Integrative Veterinary Clinic in Sorrento Valley. So if you are in the Southern California area, you can always access her. Another fantastic thing that Dr. Kangas is now doing is she is one of the advocates in the network that is on dogly.com. So dogly, D-O-G-L-Y.com is a wonderful uh, website and resource, a great uh, uh, new, if you don't know of it already, uh, opportunity for you to learn and to grow and to get access to a lot of knowledge. So Dr. Kangas, as mentioned, is one of the advocates on there and what it is, there are many, you can go on the site and see them. And so there's some free content from Dr. Kangas and then there's some paid content as well where you can dive deeper into being a member with her group and getting rich content and some of, you know, really getting into the deeper teachings and uh, getting uh, great information to be able to support the life for your dog and the challenges that it may face along the way. So thank you, Dr. Kangas, for jumping on to that, for being willing to participate in something like that to get your voice out even further and wider. Thank you. It is such a wonderful forum to be able to share. And there's lots of different advocates on there from different um you know, areas of expertise, uh, you know, like trainers and behaviorists and all kinds of stuff. Meg Harrison, who does Black Wing Forms, Flower Essences, is now on there. That's as well. great. So it's a wonderful collection of people to, to gain knowledge and information from. So um, I'm excited to be part of it and uh, posting on there regularly. So. Fantastic. Well, I'm excited to have you part of it too. And I was on there this morning looking around. I also enjoyed that there are people who help you with dog businesses, like dog-based businesses. So they're business builders or developers. So even that side of, of mm -hmm. connection with our dog community can be found. So yeah, that's pretty cool. Very cool. You're right. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. So um, back to our topic today. What we wanted to talk about is the first response to digestive upset. So maybe, you know, like us, you have come home to find uh, some poop or diarrhea, maybe the looser type that is no fun to clean up and you're just like, oh goodness. Or you're sleeping restfully in your fluffy bed and all of a sudden you hear that lovely sound that wakes you faster than anything in the world, a dog vomiting. <laughs> Right. <laughs> or maybe so it's so familiar. It's so familiar. We're all getting the vision. <laughs> Faster than anything, you're like boo, completely wide awake. <laughs> Had a towel in hand, trying to yeah. move them to the tile, right? right. <laughs> like any piece of material that isn't your good carpet. Exactly. Um, <laughs> Renee's t shirts have found that. <laughs> so, okay, that's BMI. But I think that you know what I mean, and um, and even maybe on the lighter side of things where you've gone to feed your dog in the morning and it just, they don't want to eat, and then you try again later on and they just don't want to eat, and they're just feeling a little under the weather. So what do we do? You know, so oftentimes I talk to clients who are like, I'm going to the, to the vet right now. Well, sure, you can do that, and of course, we have our beautiful veterinarians that we love and support, so we're certainly not saying otherwise. But yet, there are so many things, just like when we have a human child, that we can do, that, that we would take a few steps to know what to do. Maybe it can help, maybe it doesn't help. And so Dr. Kangas is here with us today to give us more information on what to do, where to go, what we can give, what we don't wanna give, and importantly, when do we wanna make sure that we get into the vet office. Yeah. So 
with that said, Dr. K, kick us off. You know, what, what did he do at that first sign? Okay, great. Yeah. And, you know, just to clarify for everyone, of course, most people who have dog children know that, you know, digestive upset is a very common thing that's going to occur throughout their life. And it might be more common in puppies even than adults, but certainly it's a very common thing. One of the most, uh, you know, typical reasons that a pet gets brought into their veterinarian is for some sort of gastrointestinal upset, especially if it's more of an urgent care situation. But our discussion today is a really great one for a few reasons. As you mentioned, Amanda, it's really nice to kind of paint a picture for people so they have a little bit better of understanding as to what really constitutes an urgency so they don't have to maybe get you know, overreact and get, you know, really stressed about it. Uh, so we can, you know, kind of talk through that. And then the other neat thing about doing this topic today is it's really quite appropriate in the holiday season because of course gastrointestinal upset can happen year round, but it is a very common thing to be happening at this season and time of the year because there's so many foods out and sweets out and all kinds of things that your dogs can get into. A lot of dogs get uh, problems around Thanksgiving or right after Thanksgiving. So this time between Thanksgiving and Christmas is, is a big, you know, kind of window of higher risk uh, for pets to be getting uh, GI issues. So it's a great topic for today. And, you know, at first sign when things are happening that, or, or when you're noticing any symptoms, you know, that really is the answer would depend, of course, on how significant their sy symptoms are. And so if, you know, if there is vomiting, uh, for instance, definitely one of the first things you want to do is not feed for a while. Okay. Now, if they're vomiting and or diarrhea, by the way, and they're still acting bright and alert and active, and they still want to do their other things, definitely don't panic. Uh, you don't have to rush out to the veterinarian, you know, always follow your intuition. I mean, if they look really ill, then they probably need to be seen right away. If they don't look ill, but they're vomiting, definitely withhold food for at least 12 to 24 hours, because when they vomit, the stomach is obviously upset or inflamed. It's called gastritis. One of the biggest treatments for gastritis is to rest the stomach. Just let the tissue rest because it's reactive right now. It's inflamed. And putting something down in there right after that into the stomach is not what the stomach wants. It needs some time to, you know, um, reset and rebalance and rest. So withholding food is really important if they vomited. Now, it's a nice thing to clarify the difference between vomiting and regurgitation, okay? Because everybody calls, when anything comes up, everybody calls it vomiting. But there's actually a distinction. And regurgitating can be no big deal oftentimes, okay? So if pets eat too fast, <laughs> if they're super excited and they're playing and running around right after they eat, those sorts of things, they can just immediately within minutes of eating a meal regurgitate and the meal looks like it was you know, barely digested at all. It just kind of looks like the food that just went down, okay? That's rarely an issue unless it's happening all the time, then of course it is an issue. But if it's happening sporadically at those typical times where they just woof down their food really fast or they're really active, then you don't need to over, you know, react to that one. Um, but true vomiting is coming from the stomach and kind of the the um, sound that you portrayed for everyone, the woo, woo, you know, that's what you're going to see or hear with true vomiting. And, uh, and that can be in response to dietary indiscretion, we call it, where they just get into something that bothered their stomach, which kind of this time of year is a big deal for that. Um, or there can be, you know, numerous other uh, reasons that it can happen, whether it is something that is more of a chronic situation or more of an acute situation. So, and then, you know, we can talk about the other end of things, you know, that's a, a big discussion on vomiting. Um, and then we can talk about diarrhea as well, but I'll give you a moment, Amanda, to interject in case you have any questions or think there's a good uh, angle we can uh, relate to people at this point. Well, thank you, Dr. Kangas. And that's exactly it, you know, kind of stepping into this um, step by step is great. I think it's so important to also bring up kind of the different ages and different circumstances, you know, uh, uh, that dogs can experience or that that we're kind of noticing with our dogs. And I just want to, before we carry on, invite all of you to share this out and let us know, first of all, that you're here and who you're watching with and where you're watching from. 
but also share this out because this is of course why we do this and I should I know that all of you on the line want that as well you want to be able to get this information further and wider so that people are more clear more empowered and and a, our big intention is leaning towards more natural care more holistic um, support so that our animals can truly heal from the inside out. And that's what, of course, Dr. Kingus is, is so good at guiding us on. So that said, yeah, so if we, so we see that our animal has vomited a bit, it's not regurgitation just from kind of going halfway down and coming back up, but it is what I commonly will see is yellow and a little foamy. Um, okay. Sometimes I'll find that in the morning too. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up because I did want to talk about that specific scenario. Um, when you're seeing some yellowish, you know, foam come up and not food, then that truly is vomit and that yellow or sometimes greenish um, color is bile, okay, coming up. And that means the stomach was empty. And so the bile is coming up. Now, you know, most people have heard of the term acid reflux or even GERD, which stands G-E-R-D, gastroesophageal reflux disorder, um, or um, heartburn, you know, all of these kinds of things, indigestion that people get. This is very common in dogs as well. And it is very um, typical for dogs with uh, in these indigestion or reflux issues to vomit early in the morning or sometimes in the middle of the night. Um, and oftentimes that's when, obviously when the stomach is empty and for some dogs, it's just a matter of the fact that the stomach is empty for so many hours and then the bile's coming up. There's no, you know, the gastric juices are all there ready to, to digest food and there's no food coming in and the stomach gets kind of irritated. So for pets that do that on a regular basis, it is a very good thing to feed them a late night snack before bed. Uh, I see these doggies that vomit bile in the early morning or the middle of the night. Um, typically, they are pets that have an earlier dinner time. So, you know, some people may feed at like seven in the morning and then dinner's like at five o'clock and then other people might feed dinner at eight o'clock at night. So if the dinner is earlier, the stomach is obviously empty longer overnight and those doggies are more prone to having gastric reflux in the early morning hours or in the middle of the night before they get fed again. So late night snack and see a, a conventional veterinarian, a lot of them are starting to realize that a, that a late night little snack is a, is a very big advantage, but traditionally a lot of people recommend antacids and medications and, you know, Pepsid and Zantac and Prilosec. And the vast majority of the time, you don't need to turn to anything like that. A late night snack meal is golden for these doggies. So that's a great thing to know about. Now, if it's, <clears throat> excuse me, not that timing or, you know, it doesn't seem to fit that, there's certainly other reasons that they could be vomiting bile. Uh, and those are things that, you know, you would need to look in a little deeper with your veterinarian if obviously that's appropriate, which it probably would be. So mm -hmm. if it's a different scenario. Yeah, that's great. And yeah. how do we know, so if our dog, say they're not vomiting, they just are um, not eating. Yeah. How do we even know in the first place if that actually is digestive or if there's a different issue? Is there yeah, a that's a great question. And in some scenarios, it may be difficult to discern that. Um, but what I would be looking for, which you may often be able to, you know, detect is if there are any signs of, you know, uh, indigestion at all, if there are, is there any gut noise, you know, a lot of times when they have digestive upset, you'll hear a louder gurgly tummy. Um, sometimes you'll hear burping, which is upper GI or lip smacking, um, the other, uh, lip smacking can be they're either nauseous or they're having indigestion and some uh, acid reflux, you know, coming up. Uh, and the um, so, yeah, the the burping, the lip smacking and the cough gag reflux. Sometimes you'll see, too. And sometimes people may not realize that's a digestive thing because they look like they're coughing, but it's kind of like they're clearing their throat. So sometimes you might see a little throat movement and then you'll go, see them go <laughs> like they're almost coughing, but it's because there's acid indigestion, you know, occurring. So any of those things would be a tip off that it's digestive. Um, other things, maybe like lower digestion gas, obviously if they're gassy or flatulent and you're, you know, smelling 
GI gas, then that would, of course, be another tip off. And clearly, if their stools are not right or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, you know, it's certainly possible that it could be digestive and you're not going to see any symptoms of that. But oftentimes you can pick up something that will give you a clue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, that's great. That, those are exactly what I was looking for. All those little, little things, like you said, even with yeah. the coffee, sometimes yeah. you think something stuck in their throat, but it's actually irritating them there and right energy there. And I'll add in too, you know, there are some dogs that have a, you know, pattern of being very finicky eaters. And, you know, oftentimes gastric reflux or indigestion is a part of that. And so I love to help resolve that for doggies in a natural way without using the antacids and the, you know, Prilosex and all that kind of stuff. So if it's a pattern, definitely touch in with me or a holistic veterinarian or a veterinarian that you trust to work through that problem and find good solutions for your doggy. But if it's not a pattern and it's just, you know, occurring, then look for those signs and then use your judgment as to at what point, you know, they need to get seen. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I just wanted to mention is that we have our Sama dog balancing biscuits, you know, our little uh, biscuits that now, by the way, Dr. Kingus, I don't think I shared with you, I sourced uh, pesticide-free, gluten-free oats. <laughs> and so certified <laughs> pesticide-free. So we know for sure that there's no glyphosate. And nice move. I love yeah, it. Since we've done <laughs> previous talks on that, as soon as we had that talk, I was like, oh, my biscuits. So, <laughs> so we went back to the family. Good job. Thank you. But the reason I bring this up is because what I have found, because they're absorptive, you know, like more of a protein or a meat treat is always great too, and dogs love them, but they're not quite as absorptive and squishy. And and so these treats, because they're little biscuits, you know, they're dry and they crumble. I noticed that the ones that have, I have two versions, one have, has ginger in it, ginger and goji berry. And that one, if I give it to a dog in the evening, like at 1030 or whatnot, if their stomach or their lip smack in, or they have had a little bit of that vomit, I've noticed a big change when I give them that little biscuit at night. Isn't so, that great? Mm -hmm. yes. So Violet, you know, always gets them before bed because you told yep. me that that could be one of the issues. Yeah. That's a great thing to use for a, for a late night snack. So yeah. nice choice. <laughs> Thank so, you. And they smell delicious too. Yeah. Um, and so, one of the other yeah. things that I would love to offer, and I honestly, I had it set aside for visual, but it's in the other room. Uh, one of the remedies, I have a few things set aside when we talk about uh, diarrhea and soft stool part of our discussion today to show for demonstrations for people what I like to recommend. But on the topic of vomiting and upper GI issues, uh, I really like Nux Vomica. And Nux Vomica is a homeopathic remedy. And if people aren't familiar with homeopathy, that is different from herbs. Homeopathy generally when you you can buy it in places like Sprouts and Whole Foods and health stores and of course you can buy it online You can buy anything online these days um, But Nox Vomica is a fantastic remedy to have in your household for both dogs and people. Okay um, It homeopathic remedies usually come in little pellets. Sometimes you can buy them in liquid tinctures Nox Vomica is almost always in little pellets and you can just take three four pellets. It's not dose dependent. So really you can't do too much. Don't worry about it, but you can just put them inside the, the lip of, or inside the cheek of your dog's mouth and just let them dissolve in the saliva there. Um, and Nux Vomica can literally be magic and it's so safe. You know, homeopathy is one of the safest things you can do for anybody, baby, you know, human babies, everybody. Um, and whenever there's digestive upset, certainly nausea, I mean, as the name Nux Vomica kind of implies, um, if there's any vomiting or nausea. And the nice thing is, again, the person or dog is not swallowing this. So I mentioned when you're vomiting, you don't want to have to swallow anything. And so homeopathy works great in that regard too, because they're just absorbing it from the mucous membranes. Okay. But anytime there's nausea, indigestion, stomach cramping, you know, yucky tummy for your dog or yourself, Nux Vomica can be tremendously helpful. So and always safe. Dr. K, I may have been typing when you said this, but did you say exactly how to give it? Uh, yeah, you can put some pellets in um, there and they usually will come in like little tubes in the store like this because they're people will put them in your purse or your bag and travel with them. They're awesome. And uh, you can just twist off the cap and there'll be little pellets. Just toss some pellets in your doggy's mouth on the inside of the lip or, you know, inside the cheek and just let them dissolve. Mm. So, yeah, they could just dissolve in their saliva and just 
you know, it's, it's very, very easily absorbed into the body that way. You actually don't, and if they ingest it, that's fine. I mean, if they swallow it, that's fine, but it will work better in the body for a human or a dog if it absorbs from the mucous membranes of the mouth, the gingival area, rather than being swallowed down. Mm -hmm. And do we want to be careful to not touch them with our fingers? For that's them, actually, it's not critical, but it is advised. Okay. So if you get the, you know, oil of your fingers all over them, then it can mute the, you know, efficacy of them. So try not to, you know, but don't sweat it. You know, if it's, if, if you can't not touch them, that, that sometimes is difficult, but a lot of people will try to use the cap, mm -hmm. to, you know, dump them into the mouth or mm -hmm. your own mouth or whatever. So, but yeah, such a useful remedy to have on hand. Yeah, really. And um, you can take it multiple times, you know, within even an hour or a day, you know, homeopathy a lot of times they'll say take it every 15 minutes for like the first hour just to really you know get it um working in your system so yeah, yeah. So wonderful thing to know about and that's spelled yeah. Nuxomica by the way is n-u-x and then separate word v-o-m-i-c-a nux vomica yeah. so i put it up you can't see that part of it but i put it up on the yeah, so, and some of our, Donna's on the line too, and she wrote it too. Yay. So, <laughs> and Trish. Well, Donna is well versed. <laughs> yeah, all of our, all of our homies, they, they're all aware, they are using it too. Okay, so we notice some digestive upset. It's either vomiting or we'll, we'll get into diarrhea a little bit more, but basically as a first step, we wanna stop food, withhold food, as long as they're not looking really lethargic and very ill and maybe you know their gums are white if we look at them if we're seeing that sort of thing we need to go to the doc but if the dog is still acting normal it's just obviously got some gurgly belly we, we do not feed for 24 hours and mm -hmm. and maybe give some nux vomica yep what are our next steps do you think so then i you know i would monitor them and you know obviously observe them closely and don't you know, leave for a whole day or something like that and just make sure that they're coming along. You know, odds are the majority of the time, if they're still looking happy and running around, they're probably going to be fine. Um, but, you know, obviously things can progress differently as, you know, if something is more um, significant, then clearly they're not going to get you know, turn around quickly and get better, you're going to see other things that are going to tip you off that you need to do more. But, uh, you know, if, if they look good, I, you know, wouldn't necessarily say you need to rush them anywhere. Just keep an eye on them and kind of, you know, what you would do for yourself. You know, mm -hmm. if you know, when you're like, okay, I got to go to the ER, I am sick. Um, so, you know, just use your judgment in those kind of situations where, you know, the first time you feel sick, you usually don't run to the ER unless you really know that there's a, a major, major issue. So, mm -hmm. and then what about water? If the dog isn't eating, obviously that's kind of a good thing to be able to get, create that detox, but what about water? Will they drink and should they drink? Should we be concerned? Yeah, I would give water before food, but if they have just vomited, I wouldn't give them water for several hours, you know, or at least a few hours. Um, because again, that could just come right back up to and irritate the stomach. So, um, so wait on water for, you know, a couple hours. And, um, you know, if they're, if they're, you know, really significant digestive upset, then we often wait on water even longer, but, um, a fasting of 12 to 24 hours is a wonderful thing to rest an irritated stomach. So, and at that point, we should see our animal feeling a little bit better, ready for some like bland foods. Is that better to introduce in the beginning? Absolutely. So, um, you know, a lot of people are very familiar with either boiled chicken and rice or boiled you know, low fat hamburger and rice, or um, even cottage, cheese, low fat cottage cheese and rice have all been things that have been recommended uh, by veterinarians and other animal professionals for years and years. And that's totally appropriate for digestive upset, unless you know that, by the way, that your particular dog doesn't respond well to any of those things, then don't use them. Mm -hmm. But for the majority of dogs, that is a, you know, very good choice for a bland diet. Um, just just temporarily. So we don't want to keep them on that diet for obviously months at a time um, because it is very unbalanced, but unbalanced, you know, dietary items for short term, several days, not a big deal at all. So a bland diet is fine for a few days or even a little longer if that's needed. Uh, and that is enough to turn tons of dogs around. A lot of people are like, oh, you know, I hear all the time, my dog had digestive upset, fed, fed him a bland diet for a couple of days, poof, they're fine. 
Yep. Um, so yeah, so that's a wonderful thing to do because those are things that are very easy on the stomach and the digestive system uh, to not create a lot of work. Vegetables and all that, that's a little more effort for the stomach to digest. So that's mm -hmm. why just the meat and an easily um, digestible carb source like a rice is, is a good way to go for temporary to get them back on track. Yeah. And I find it really interesting. I was actually um, communicating with our friend Larry yesterday, who McLaren, his dog was having some digestive upset, as you know. And I was explaining to Larry that it's very natural for a dog. He was concerned about fasting him, that he would be hungry. And I said, actually, if you look into the wild, animals do that all the time. The first thing they do as soon as they have a belly ache is they stop eating for a little while. So it's exactly. very natural. It's it's very instinctual and it, you know it's very common sense that that would be helpful and yes in the wild you know they have to fast naturally often just because they have to hunt for their food so it gives yeah. their stomach some you know rest time but yeah they would inherently know that if they have uh, an issue they're not going to be eating on top of that so that makes perfect sense and of course we advocate a lot of holistic vets including myself advocate for intermittent fasting for dogs just like it's recommended for people and with my doggy sage once or twice a week i'll skip a meal so that she'll get more fasting time and it just helps to rest the gut um, for all kinds of healing. And obviously if the gut's irritated, we want that healing. But even if if you're in a healthy state, um, resting when, when the body's not digesting, working on digestion, it's working on cleanup mode and detoxification. So your body and your dog's body will actually stay cleaner and healthier if there is some downtime with digestion and the gut does get to rest on a periodic basis. So great, great advice. Mm -hmm. That's great. So let's take a question here and then we'll get into some more goodness. But Jane says, would you treat a senior dog with digestive issues differently? Ah, that's a great question. Um, not really inherently. I mean, unless I, I think I, I'm thinking that uh, at first evaluation of, of my thought process here that I would take it into account as the individual. I mean, seniors are more likely to have kind of a, a pattern of things that have been going on in their lives. So I would probably be delving in deeper as to what their history of digestion is. Do they have any other health ailments that might be impacting this? So as an individual, uh, that may make a difference. But I think just inherently a puppy versus an adult you know, we kind of would do the same things with the fasting and, you know, the nox vomica and, you know, the, the monitoring and all that. I think that would all be the same. It's just if that older pet may have a history of other things that would be more likely to impact the current situation than a puppy with, you know, no, no health problems that could have accumulated at that point. So. Mm -hmm. Great. And, and actually, I, I do have another thought, though, for that for the person who asked that question. That's a great is I will I will say this just came to my mind is that a puppy is more likely to have uh, potentially ingested something that could be either obstructing the gut or toxic. And certainly that can happen with an older dog, too. But of course, puppies are going to be very prone and notorious for swallowing objects. And that's one thing that will require oftentimes, not always, sometimes we luck out and they either poop it out or they vomit it up. But, you know, if you suspect that your puppy swallowed, you know, ingested a toy or a piece of a toy or whatever, I mean, you know, you name it, obviously dogs eat everything from shoes to underwear to, you know, rocks. I mean, we've all, you know, Every veterinarian who's been around for a while has taken rocks out of intestines and but also seen them poop out all kinds of crazy stuff. So with puppies, that's something to definitely be aware of. So great, great discussion there. Thanks for that mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Jane. And I invite all of you to ask your questions. Anything that's gone on, anything that you've seen along the way, anything that's helped you, please share. That's what it's all about. We'd love to connect with you. So let's move on to diarrhea. <laughs> Not every day that you get excited about diarrhea. I know. <laughs> so, okay. So we talked about, you know, if we see the vomiting, if we see the, the imbalance, the fasting, the nux vomica, if we do see a lot of diarrhea 
uh, what do we do besides clean it up and try to, you know, keep them on the tile? <laughs> what okay. else do we do? Yes. So again, you know, the bland diet can also, by the way, be very helpful for diarrhea. And obviously, uh, you know, soft stools and diarrhea can either be an acute problem or it can definitely be a, a chronic problem or an intermittent problem. So that happens a lot too. Uh, if they are, you know, it's kind of the same rules apply to our discussion on issues with the upper gut is if they're having diarrhea, but they are still acting happy, active, energetic, all that, again, don't panic. We'll talk about some things right now that you can do to you know, mitigate that. But once again, if they're having diarrhea and they are acting very lethargic and sick, then we need to do something more you know, with urgent care and obviously have them seen. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that we can, um, uh, clarify is whether the diarrhea is obviously just soft stool or whether we've got mucus or blood involved. If there is mucus or blood, that generally just means that the colon, which is the very end of the intestine, right before it comes out, you know, to the to the rectum, that the colon is inflamed and irritated. And that's what puts mucus on the stool. And then that's what when they'll have blood. If the stool is dark, kind of a tarry coal color, then that's usually a a significant symptom that there's blood coming up from higher in the intestine, like the small intestine. So if you're seeing that like dark tarry stool, then I would uh, go to a veterinarian and, and really have things evaluated. But if it's fresh blood, that can be an acute thing. The colon's irritated and um, that can resolve very quickly oftentimes. So um, those are good things to distinguish. But I would like to say, so I did bring some demos of, of things that I can show as wonderful things. Most people are aware of the fantastic power of the home remedy pumpkin, okay? So canned pumpkin, preferably organic pumpkin, is a fantastic thing you can do for just about any dog, unless you know they won't eat it or they most dogs don't have a have a dietary issue with pumpkin uh, and most dogs like it and the fibers the natural fiber in pumpkin is very beneficial for helping to firm up the stool and for normalizing you know colon function so oftentimes people just add pumpkin to their dog's food and the diarrhea will resolve okay so bland diet pumpkin wonderful things to start with um, and then the other thing that I wanted to show everybody because this product is magic and I love it. I and love it you know that Amanda and I are big fans of Honest Kitchen and Lucy Postens, the founder of this uh, company is local to us and we adore her and her products. And this stuff, I literally told Lucy the last time I saw her, she needs to make this in double size cans mm -hmm. because this can is too small for anybody with a multiple dog household you need this to get stuck in this stuff. So anyway, um, it says on here, perfect form. And that is literally because this product helps to keep stools in perfect form. And then it says digestive aid. It comes in a powder in here. So for small dogs, really small dogs, like a quarter teaspoon, um, medium dogs, half teaspoon, large dogs, like a whole teaspoon, either once or twice a day in the, in the, in the food. Um, you just mix it in their food and most dogs are totally fine with this flavor unless they're super finicky. Um, if they're having a, you know, significant diarrhea problem, I would definitely use it twice a day. If the problem is mild or you're just using it routinely just to keep their stools happy and their, their gut functioning really well, then you could just do it once a day or you could choose to use it as needed. It's a wonderful tool if you're doing dietary changes where your pet is more likely to have some digestive upset. Um, and the kind of ingredients in here are things like slippery elm and papaya and uh, pumpkin, pectin and fennel. So it smells like fennel. It actually smells good to me. And this is all human grade. This is all stuff that's really wonderful for your gut. So you could put this in your smoothie every day and your gut would be better as well. So the fibers in there will help to firm up the stool. And the great thing about perfect form is it will work for it as, as will plain pumpkin, but this is more ingredients, so it's more comprehensive. These products will work for either constipation or diarrhea, by the way. So mm -hmm. with constipation, they help keep the colon or the digestion moving through the intestine and stools coming out normally. And then with um, soft stools, they'll help firm that up and help the digestive processes work better. So those are wonderful things to know about.
and I'll be sure to post these links below afterwards so that anybody can go back and resource them. Yeah. So, and then I will mention uh, one more product option or maybe even two actually. Um, and these maybe these won't be as easily uh, obtained for people as the other products that are obviously grocery store and over the counter. You can get Honest Kitchen stuff anywhere, pet store online, that sort of thing, um, or my practice for that matter. But um, the other thing that I'm a big fan of, let me see if I can show so people can actually see, are clay products. This is a capsule form called BioSponge, and this is a powdered form from RX Vitamins called RX Clay. And these are truly wonderful things to use for dogs. Uh, and there are human versions made of these things too. And so what these are is these are natural clays. Some people may have heard of the term betonite clay. That's a common one that people use for themselves. And it's in a lot of detox. Uh, if you're doing like a little detox program for yourself, a lot of them will recommend to do a betonite clay tablet or powder or whatever in your smoothie because clay will help to bind toxins. So if your dog ate anything that's irritating him, just like you, if you're like traveler's diarrhea, if you're out traveling and you eat something that was you know, bad for your stomach, then if you take a clay, it will carry it through your body and firm up the stool. So for me, when I travel, I take clay tablets with me before taking them. I would ever take anything like Imodium, I would take clay and it works fantastically for dogs and for people. And so it's gonna detoxify the system and it's gonna firm up the stool. Uh, and if there's ever blood or mucus, this stuff can work magically. And I would definitely turn to this as a natural alternative before I would do metronidazole, flagyl, the typical antibiotic that most veterinarians prescribe. And you know, we know with human medical, the human medical system and the veterinary medical system, we're really over prescribing antibiotics generally. And we need to really be conscious about scaling back on the overuse of antibiotics. And yes, metronidazole can work very well, but if we don't have to turn to an antibiotic, it's so much better for our dogs because then it's not going to disrupt the microbiome, the immune system, all these other things, the stool may get better, but then we've caused ramifications of other things by using antibiotics all the time and using that as our first choice rather than looking for really great tools that can um, eliminate our need to turn to antibiotics so often. So wanted everybody to know about those because those are a gem and I dispense them a lot. What you just shared there, Dr. K, is so important. That is that's the core of this whole conversation is I think some people don't even realize that those medications <laughs> named are actually antibiotics. They just know that, oh, my dog's not feeling well, let me take them in. Oh, they gave him some stuff. I hear that all the time. Oh, they gave him some stuff, He's feeling better in a day. But what is that stuff and what is the outcome? And what what is that doing to the system? What is that doing to the environment in this overly medicated, overly, um, prescribed environment, even into our water stream and our food sources. Wow. So we need to be more careful than we are. And that is certainly the big difference, huge difference between the holistic approach versus the conventional approach. I almost want to like repeat that whole thing again, but I think that <laughs> what I'm doing is that there are alternatives. There are yes. alternatives. If you are listening to this and you happen to have missed them, just rewind a little bit because there are a few great steps to take, many great steps to take before you would go into pharmaceuticals. And yes. Why Thank not? You. Mm -hmm. Thank you for you know adding good perspective to that bit of our conversation because to me that is such a a, a, an important topic and discussion for people to have more awareness that you know what what is being prescribed and are there you know other alternatives and in fact I was very excited to see that a mainstream veterinary journal conventional veterinary not holistic journal uh, just had an article last month about the overuse of antibiotics and they specifically brought up metronidazole and flagyl because mm -hmm. so many pets I mean we you know it's just thrown out like you know first choice for everything. And it was saying we really need to scale back on this. And oftentimes it, it is not necessary to be used. Yeah. So it's really neat to have this discussion today for people to understand all these other options that we can utilize. Mm -hmm. Well, that's exactly what Rena, our beloved Rena says here. She says, I hear this topic of discussion several times a day at work. She works at Dexter's Deli, a natural yes. partner. A great to have more info and products in my arsenal when speaking with customers. Yay! And, and thank you, Rena. And I'm glad you, um, 
um, chimed in for many reasons. Uh, nice to hear from you. But also, I know Rena is very familiar with the Animal Essentials line. And of course, they carry those at Dexter's. And I did have that here as well. Um, I keep a bottle of this at home and you guys are going to laugh at me, but I often take this too if I feel <laughs> like I need to. So this is for animals, but it's such good quality. Obviously, it's safe for people. But colon rescue is something that is another great formula. This is a liquid and um, it does not taste bad at all. So most dogs will readily you know, eat this either in their food. I mean, this is for typically diarrhea, not vomiting. So you can be feeding them and uh, put this in the food. And it's only a small volume. It'll say on the back of the bottle for your uh, doggy's weight size, how much you would give them. But uh, Colon Rescue is a liquid that has several of the, or at least a few of the same ingredients that Honest uh, Kitchen Perfect Form would have in it. And um, this is just four ingredients and it's slippery elm, marshmallow root, licorice root, and um, uh, plantain. Okay, for the fiber. So that is a is a great formula to know about as well and very readily available either at good, you know, quality pet stores or even online, of course. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. great. Yeah, I've used that product before. I'd never really thought so much into the ingredients and how they are similar. All of these, you know, you see that what the body needs is slipperiness even though there's diarrhea but it's kind of almost counterintuitive right but actually it's the lubrication i'm assuming and yeah and slippery, mm -hmm. slippery elm is actually known to help heal inflammation in the lining of the intestine mm -hmm. or the gut so and slippery elm is so safe so a lot of people are very familiar if they have any herbal knowledge or kind of natural healing knowledge. Um, slippery elm is, you know, used in humans and dogs all the time. And so it'll show up repeatedly in a lot of digestive formulas for good reason. Mm -hmm. uh, and just a wonderful tool for the gut and, you know, helps to soothe uh, the irritation in there and help it to heal faster too. So that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Nina has a couple other suggestions here. Love the AE colon rescue and daily digestion as yes, well. Yes, funny. I was going to show that one. I'm like, I'm getting excessive with showing my products. Thank <laughs> you. Ryan. You are so awesome. There's daily digestion. So this what is one different? that I would say is working more for the upper gut probably, but you know, mm -hmm. still the whole thing. This one is ginger as most people. I mean, Amanda is very familiar with ginger because that's used with Ayurvedic medicine all the time. So this is ginger root, fennel, uh, seed chamomile, of course, we know is very calming and peppermint. Mm -hmm. Peppermint is fantastic for digestion. So you guys are going to laugh at me, but I drop this in my water and I drink this oftentimes just for better digestion. So, um, but yeah, that's a wonderful tool too. That one would be maybe more for upper gut stuff, but you know, you, you're not going to go wrong in using it. These are all such safe, safe items to use. So, you know, worst case scenario, your dog may have an intolerance to one of the ingredients in here, unlikely, but can happen, or their stomach is upset. So you give it and they, you know, vomit it back up or something like that. But these things are all very safe inherently. So wonderful things to, to have on hand. Well, and the big difference, I think it's very obvious, but again, just to kind of point a, a spotlight on it is that the big difference between the conventional pharmaceutical medicines are that they are chemical based, where these are plant based. These are nature. We are nature. We are all made up of the same elements as we talk about in Ayurveda. And so when we bring in the same elements that are within our body, it's like our body coheres, you know, and I, I you certainly could explain this better than I could, but it's like our body receives it and there's coherence and there's acceptance and there's a release of what's not needed, but a utilization of what is. And where pharmaceuticals come in and it's like this whole foreign entity that probably will have a certain effect based on research, but also can have a lot of other impact that it's making. Yes, so, so true. And thank you for sharing that. And while you were speaking, I was thinking as you're talking about plant medicine and all these natural things, one category that I didn't bring up, which is kind of cool to cover as well, is essential oils are another fantastic thing that can be used because, you know, even in this formula that we just talked about, there's peppermint, um, you know, and it could be an essential oil form, uh, most likely used in a, in a liquid tonic like that. Um, and we know peppermint is very good for digestion. And that's why mint oftentimes, by the way, would be on, you know, a plate 
like a dessert or a plate, you eat the mint back in the day where people actually, you know, kind of utilize their herbs in that way. Um, the, the serving mint on a plate had a purpose. It was actually to help you digest your meal. And so anyway, essential oils can have a lot of powerful um, applications and oftentimes don't even have to be ingested. Certainly you can ingest them, but you can apply essential oils on your pet as well or diffuse it around them for benefit. And so certainly ginger is an essential oil that can be used and peppermint. There are blends though that are made specific, specifically for dogs. And I love uh, Dr. Melissa Shelton's line. She is a veterinarian who is one of the leading authorities with essential oil um, therapies for pets. And she now has her own line of oils or has for several years now. And it's called Animal EO, capital EO, which stands for essential oils, or she pronounces it Animalio. So mm -hmm. animalio.info is her website. And she actually has a formula. She has very cute names for all of her blends that have been specifically designed for, and she's got a, a extensive website. So they may be designed for dogs, cats, hamsters, birds, horses, everything. And she has a blend called GI Joe. Mm -hmm. And that is one that's going to have things like ginger and fennel and things like that in there. And you can actually just rub it on your pet's belly and they can uh, get fantastic therapeutic benefits just from topical applications. So she's got very um, explicit directions on her website and a lot of information. You can sign up for free newsletters. She's very educational and she'll send out stuff um, every Friday, I think, for uh, people to learn all about different topics within using essential oils for your pets. So that's another nice modality to be aware of. Mm -hmm. There's so many options, you know, it makes me, it makes me want to put little screens of this talk on the front doors of every veterinary office and just say, please just watch this and take right. a few steps first, you know, because exactly. there are so many things we can do. That's why this conversation is so valuable because, I mean, you know, I don't think any of us realized how many things there are that we can do or tools that we can have in our cabinet at home and whip out for ourselves or for our dogs. So many of them can be shared um, when the situations arise. So super helpful. We have a, a question here from Heather. She asks, how much pumpkin is appropriate to give a medium sized 40 pound dog? Great question. And you know, can be a variable answer, but I would say a tablespoon or two would be a good amount for that size dog. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, and, and you can kind of use your judgment as if they, you know, tend to be sensitive to things, but that, that should be perfectly fine. Tablespoon mm -hmm. or two, I think would be great. And is it okay, I had this question recently, to an animal that does have sensitive belly issues or just a sensitive belly overall, is it okay to give them pumpkin every meal? Absolutely, or at least every day. Yeah, you can do it every meal or once a day. And people do that routinely. So if you're doing it that routinely, I might drop like for that 40 pound dog, I might do a tablespoon rather than two tablespoons mm -hmm. if, if you're doing it uh, you know, super routinely. But you know, there's some playroom in there where it's not, doesn't need to be super exact, but yeah, on a routine basis is totally fine. And that's why, you know, a lot of people use perfect form every day and there's ground pumpkin in there. So. I'm just reading through some of the comments that came in um, around the essential oils too. We love calm. Oh, that I do too. And you want to know what's great, Kelly, thank you for that comment. Calm a mile is a specific blend made by Dr. Melissa Shelton at animal EO and or animalio and um, calm a mile has an incredible, incredible scent. Like I love it. I keep it for myself in my home. I've got it in my next room in my bedroom. Um, and I'm in my office right now. Uh, but calm a mile is made for pets, but it's wonderful for us too. So mm -hmm. it can calm any kind of tissue. So it can calm your stomach. It can calm your mind. It can calm muscle cramping. You can, you know, use it for numerous uh, applications. Mm -hmm. So anxiety and things like that. It sounds like mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. it's a wonderful, wonderful blend mm -hmm. of species. Here's just a comment from Christine. Good idea. I freeze pumpkin in ice cube trays and feed most days. Yay! That is a great idea. Yeah, that way when you open a can, you don't have to, you know, let it get uh, old in the refrigerator. So that's a great idea. Yeah, well, that is a good point. That is what often happens. I sometimes think they need to make little cans, like little short cans, like almost a tuna can size of yep. pumpkin because you, you know, unless you have a lot of dogs that you're giving it to. So that's a yeah. great suggestion. Yeah. 
freezing little cubes is a perfect thing to do. Uh huh. So. Okay, so our last question, which actually there's the two of them that are the same. So we'll just pull up Donna's. Would a teaspoon be a good amount for a dog under 10 pounds? Someone asked about a chihuahua. Oh, Donna. Perfect. Yeah. Yes, Donna. And thank you. That is a perfect amount for a little, little bitty doggy kid. Cool. Yep. <laughs> so, and then if, uh, if there's not another question that you're going to take directly right now, I thought, I know we're getting close to time, but one of the things that I thought would be really great to incorporate in our discussion today is potentially the ingestion of chocolate or other sweets. Mm, yeah, uh, let's do it is the time of year where there's a lot of sweets and people are getting chocolate gifts and all that kind of stuff. And that chocolate toxicity, of course, is a huge concern and a big awareness amongst most um, doggy parents. And so I thought that would be nice to um, add in today. And I, ironically, and uh, with some humor here, my doggy Sage, who many of you have maybe seen in pictures or, or with me somehow, um, she is a yellow Labrador and she's about 65 pounds. And last year, someone gifted me a one pound box of C's candy, okay? And it was in it was in beautiful Christmas wrap, you know, green and red wrap and all that. And um, it was in my home and it was on a shelf that, it was wrapped, I didn't even think about it. And Sage is not normally, you know, a, a doggy that really gets into a lot of stuff. Like I'm pretty cavalier with, you know, leaving treats in places where she could get to it if she really wanted to. And she doesn't have an issue with it. So never even dawned on me. And I left the house for a few hours and I come home and there is green and red wrapping all over my house. And the whole pound, the whole box of chocolates is eaten except for two. Okay. So my dog ate basically a pound of C's chocolate. Um, so right. Uh, but being a veterinarian, I'm like, oh, gee, you know, she's 65 pounds. And most of that type of chocolate is milk chocolate. It's not dark chocolate. And it's full of like nougat and caramel and, you know, nuts and all this other stuff. And um, so I knew she's probably not going to have a problem with that. Now, she could have gotten digestive upset and diarrhea, which, by the way, she didn't. <laughs> she's got a strong gut. She was fine, completely fine. It was crazy. Um, but I called my friend who's an emergency vet just to be on the safe side. And she's like, Oh, pff, a pound of C's that's, you know, milk chocolate, your dog's gonna be fine. Don't even worry about it. Um, but it's nice for people to know that there is an ingredient in chocolate called theobromine, which is actually the toxic component that is a problem for dogs that of course is not a problem for us. But the important thing to know is that when you have milk chocolate, or ch because it's very diluted with milk and sugar and stuff like that, the amount of theobromine in there really, you know, goes down. If you have dark, it's very, very dark, especially dark, like 90% chocolate, or you have baking chocolate or raw, raw cacao or something like that, then the volume or, you know, concentration of theobromine in those chocolate items is going to be much higher. And so those would be more toxic. The other big difference is, Sage was a 65 pound dog. If Donna's 10 pound, seven pound Chihuahua, Snoopy would have eaten that box of chocolate. He would have had a big, you know, he could have had a very big problem. So it's definitely weight dependent. So a small dog getting dark chocolate is a huge issue. A large dog getting a, a little bit is usually not an issue. So if you, you know, have any question, obviously, you know, if you think your dogs consume chocolate, I would definitely go to a veterinarian. But I was checking um, online today for a resource just in case people are wondering. And there's actually a website that's called vetsnow.com and it's V E T S hyphen N O W.com. They actually have a chocolate calculator where you can type in the weight of your dog, what type of chocolate they ate and the volume, and they actually give you, check this out, chocolate toxicity rating. It says negligible, and then it'll say, you gotta get to your vet. <laughs> wow. And they make a nice claim saying, hey, you know, this is guidance, use your judgment, we're not taking liability, you know, but if you're like, I really don't think it's a problem, but I just want that reassurance that it's probably not a problem, this is a great tool. Mm -hmm. If you really think intuitively or judgment wise that it's a problem, 
then maybe don't rely on this and go see your veterinarian. But if this is just a nice backup to say, hey, I think things are okay with the volume they got, then this could be a really nice tool for people to be aware of because this is the season where they're more likely to get into that sort of thing than probably any other time of the year. So, or yep. Easter. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, really. Well, and it brings my mind to something else too, and not to take us down another rabbit hole, but chocolate marijuana, you know, marijuana in chocolate, edibles. Yes. I've heard from so many vets that that's such a huge issue because now, oh, they've, got now they've got however knows how much THC. So does that, is that a resource that we could look that sort of thing up? And what are your thoughts? I, on that? No, that would be different. If, if you do have edibles and this is, a, I'm glad you brought that up because it is a big issue. And the um, herbalist, the cannabis, certified cannabis herbalist that Amanda and I both know very well, Robin Lynn, uh, has spoken about this, you know, numerous times too when we, when we teach together. And she's like, if you have edibles, absolutely keep them completely, you know, secured away from your pets because it will be attractive to them because it is in, oftentimes in chocolate to make it an easy thing for people to use for themselves. And that can be a very big issue. So not only are they getting, you know, the chocolate part of it, that's the lesser issue usually with the volume, but the, you know, depending on how strong that cannabis is and the THC, you know, component and percentage in there can be a huge issue. And dogs certainly can get marijuana toxicity. Um, most of you know, I'm a big fan of CBD oil. And when cannabis products are used appropriately for dogs, they can be a fantastic thing to do. But anything that's high in THC, you absolutely need to use caution. So keep all of that completely um, unobtainable for your pets. So mm -hmm. if they do ingest anything with THC, I see Trisha's um, comment, then I definitely would see a veterinarian and you know, you'd probably be going to an urgent care or an emergency vet hospital. And they're very, um, you know, the, these problems are becoming so common now with a lot of medical marijuana being, you know, approved and legal for, you know, people when you have, you know, a card and whatever. Uh, and so veterinary clinics are, emergency clinics are very clued into looking for this with dogs. And usually they're, they're quite uh, effective and efficient at identifying that to be the problem and treating it appropriately. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it's worth mentioning because I have a friend that just had the situation occur. Uh, I encouraged him to go in. He was very embarrassed. He was like, oh my gosh, I'm just like, I feel like the worst pet parent in the world. And I was like, don't worry. And he no. told me, he said they were so nice to him. They were like, yeah, not light yeah. and easy and put him at ease and teased him a yeah. little, you know, and just made yeah. it like really and super comfortable. You're so right. It's such a common problem now that people should not feel any judgment from that. And it's such an accepted practice for many humans for medical reasons to have that in their, you know, in their arsenal, in their home and for their own use. And so, um, you know, don't worry about that piece at all. And it is an interesting um note here to say that, uh, and which I did learn from Robin Lynn, the, the cannabis specialist, is that dogs are actually more sensitive to THC than cats mm -hmm. and humans. So dogs, in all the species studied, dogs have a higher sensitivity level to THC toxicity than other species do. And normally, cats are more sensitive to everything almost than dogs, you know, toxic levels for cats are usually way. So just know that the canine species is actually more sensitive to THC than all other species that I'm aware of. So, um, so, so marijuana toxicity should be um, not taken lightly. So if that is involved, then definitely you should see a veterinarian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, my goodness, this has been such a, a wealth of perfectly timed and perfectly shared information because it's not too much. It's just enough to, at least I, and I hope all of our viewers do too, feel really empowered. You feel that you are, because we are, our dog's health provider. Yes, we have other providers that we seek out and, and go to. Fabulous ones. You're like first line. Yes, the first we're line. the first line. Yep. And, and it's great yeah. to not only um, feel that you are empowered with information, but also empowered with the opportunity to be the advocate for your pet and to yeah. be able to decipher, like, what are some good first line things before I, you know, have to seek power from knowledge above what I have. So yeah. it's a wonderful collection to have put together. 
Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Kangas, as always. And I, again, encourage all of you to seek out her expertise in a one-on-one -on -one way. You can do it over the phone. We have many of our community members that have reached out to her and done phone consults. She is able to still go over all the medical records and give you a very good assessment of what to do with your dog. And Dr. Kangas has shared with me that she sees great benefit. She sees huge improvement in those animals as well that are on the other coast of the U.S. or wherever it may be. So just know that you can always get to her and we'll keep coming. We have big plans for 2020. We have a good strategy for Sama Dog and our Sama Saturdays to grow and expand and touch even more lives. So we're excited to share that with one, all of you. Thank you for being part of this conversation and for your interest and your, your connection to all of this work and for your love of dogs. And thank you, Dr. Kangas, always for your time. Thank you. It's so my pleasure to be here as always. And um, thank you. Thank you for inviting me and, and covering such a useful topic for everybody today. Fantastic. Well, thank you, everyone. I'll put in some of the um, references that we've made and some of the uh, the products that we've spoken about. We'll put in links below. Please share this out there with their, your community because obviously it can help so many more lives. And we love you all. Lots of wellness and blessings in this new year and through the holiday season. And we'll see you soon. Namaste. Namaste.